Frelick is director of the Refugee Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. He joins us live now from Bangkok. Um, Mr. Frelick, thank you for joining us. Tell us about the conditions that the, the people are dealing with in this refugee camp. Well, the camp is grossly overcrowded, more than 600,000 people in this one mega camp alone. Um, the camp was built haphazardly after the ethnic cleansing last year in Myanmar in a hilly forest area. And the first thing that happened was the refugees chopped down the trees to put up their bamboo and tarp huts uh, on what are now very steep, sandy slopes without anything to retain the soil. And as the monsoon ra season uh, is now upon us, a number of the, these uh, structures have washed away in landslides. Uh, flooding is also bad. And there are about uh, 22,000 or more that are considered to be highly at risk and need to be evacuated, and another 215,000 or so that are considered at risk and need to be relocated. Uh, this is at risk of flooding, uh, landslides, and uh, you know the potential is really great, particularly uh, if uh, they are hit by even stronger uh, weather events. So the calls like to do something about this, to relocate these people, who are these calls directed at? Who should be taking up heeding the call to do something? Well, the, the camp is unsustainable the way that it is now. And uh, of course, the refugees want to return to Myanmar. They have the right to return to Myanmar. But the conditions are far from conducive to uh, their return in safety and dignity. And so we have to look at other options for relocation. The government has suggested this uh, island, this as yet uninhabited island that's only 20 years old, uh, built from silt. Um, there are real questions about its sustainability, its habitability, um, water, agriculture, livelihoods. But more than anything, refugees would be isolated if they were being taken there. The government's given no assurances whatsoever that once refugees were brought to this island, that they would have the rights to move off of the island again. And uh, there's been no effort to win the consent of the refugees to go there. There's been no information. There's been no discussion. And the refugees have not consented to go. In fact, the refugees that I've spoken to uh, in the mega camp have expressed a lot of reservation about going there. Uh, one woman said to me, why would I leave a landslide area to go to a flood area? Um, the, the refugees want to stick together. They want to live in areas in proximity to where the big camp is now. And we uh, have talked to experts, and we believe there are alternative sites available in the same sub-district of Cox's Bazar, where the mega camp is located. You could decongest the camp. You could take 200,000 or more people out of the camp and move them into these uh, local areas and work as well with the local population, which is an underdeveloped, um, deprived, uh, impoverished population. And instead of having donors spend an enormous amount of money to provide basic services on this island, starting from nothing, to provide food and water, health, education, uh, rather to spend that money on the infrastructure to develop Cox's so Bazaar to the benefit both of the local community and the refugees. So if I could just touch on what you just said there. So you're basically saying you'd get the, the local community who perhaps has been resentful, get them to buy into this um, and, and that c could perhaps be helpful to the refugees. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's smart humanitarian assistance and it's thinking about humanitarian assistance going forward uh, in the continuum to development. And so building roads, which will help for the local economy, um, working on conservation projects to conserve uh, the forest lands, to do this in a planned way that engages um, both the refugees and the local community in livelihood development. This is the way to go. This is the smart approach. So in the meantime, while these, these options are being talked about, what can be done in the immediate in the immediacy now to, to alleviate some of what these refugees are dealing with? Well, here and now, I mean, there is a real risk of people um, dying in landslides. There's a real risk of um, a cyclone event and, and simply the monsoon rains themselves on this, the topography that we're talking about, these, uh, these steep inclines, uh, people that I've spoken to living in huts that, that their neighbors have already washed away and they're sitting there right on the precipice. Uh, people do need to be evacuated. They need to be brought even within the mega camp itself to safer locations. 
and uh, they certainly they're working on it. There's actually you know valiant efforts to try to shore up um, the conditions in the camp. But the Bangladesh authorities have insisted that the camp is temporary and that the solution is repatriation to Myanmar. While we agree in principle and the refugees themselves also on the right of return, the immediate concern is preventing people from suffering and preventing loss of life here and now. Um, well, let's worry about repatriation um, as time goes on, putting pressure on Myanmar to fundamentally reform, to allow refugees to go home. But in the meantime, um, there, even though it, it may have the look of permanency to build proper schools and have proper education, um, the children shouldn't be left with no education. And essentially, that's what's happening now. Um, and the flimsy uh, dwellings that they're living in um, that, that can be washed away by high winds and storms uh, need to be uh, shored up okay. as well. They but need hard, sheltered areas that can protect them in cyclones as well. Mr. Bill Frelick with Human Rights Watch, thank you very much.